you know, one thing, I mean, this has been our baby. Yeah. And it's hard to walk away from it. Oh. After, for 40 years, it's hard to walk away when we've been here from the very, very beginning. But yet, just with what you just said, it is such a comfort to know it's in such good hands. It is in good hands. Okay, welcome to the COPS podcast. We're super excited to be at National Police Week celebrating the 40th anniversary of, of concerns of police survivors and really excited to be here with Todd Pyro from uh, Fox and Friends first and from uh, Liv Bebo, our first president of COPS and Susie Sawyer, our founder and Connie, our current president. And this is Todd's gig and I'm gonna turn it over to him and have him have help us tell the story of COPS. It's, it's crazy when you, you sit in the room and you look at the the signage and it says 1984 right mm -hmm. because that is the year that cops started and so let's start at the beginning 40 years how did this all come about Susie? well it actually started in 1983. uh it was the first time the national peace officers memorial service had some widows that came in to honor their fallen officer we had time that year to send out uh, invitations and they came and it was like <coughs> Nobody knew they were really coming, but they showed up. And so um, the FOP, you want the real story? Yeah. The FOP <laughs> was having a, uh, a uh, hospitality room. And so we were in there having a great time, and suddenly one widow walks in, and everybody kind of looks, who is she? Because we didn't recognize her. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. And uh, somebody said to me, you know, Susie, uh, these women are starting to cry and uh, we don't know what to do with them, so you have to take them someplace. So I put my bear down and I took them to the FOP Lodge in D.C. and we sat around a circular table and I was with uh, a lady by the name of Trudy Chapman. And we were the only two that weren't widows. And these widows told us things that we couldn't believe. They, they kind of unmasked the, dis the dissatisfactions that they had with how they were treated by the agency. During the funeral, well, I should start first, death notification during the funeral, and afterwards it was kind of like, here's my business card, have a nice life. And they felt that they should have had a little more support from the agencies. The more they talked, the more it was like, oh my God, this is happening all across the country. My husband was a Prince George's County police officer, in his 22 years service, we lost 16 officers. And we thought we took really good care of them, but we really didn't. And so uh, there was a one lady from uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin that spoke up. Her name was Lynn Bolton at the time, but she's now Lynn Bebo, and I'll let her take it from here. I, I almost literally said, I just met somebody from yes. Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Yes. And little did I know it was her. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. And, um, yeah, I was a 26-year-old widow, and I had two very young children, and my husband had been killed in, um, in a domestic dispute <clears throat> at a women's shelter, protecting a woman and her 15-year-old son. And for the first time, I accepted that invitation to go to D.C., and for the first time ever, I was connected with other widows who got it. I, I didn't know anybody else who'd had a spouse murdered. I didn't know, and I never thought that it would be me either. Um, I never thought that. In fact, when he walked out the door that night, I said, I love you, be careful. And he turned around and looked at me and said, don't worry, me and God, we're just like this. And those were his last words to me. And um, I do have to take, take um, difference with one thing you said, okay. though, even though some departments didn't handle their widows well. Mine at that time, when not having ever had any kind of experience with a line of duty death, were absolutely incredible. And even to this day, mm, 40 good. years later, awesome. even good. to this yeah, day, awesome. in fact, they have a brand new canine and they named him after my husband. It's Bolt, Bolt the canine. That's awesome. So, um, so I, I, but I, I also know that, especially at that time, I was the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. But you the were. most important thing 
was that I was finally connected with other widows. She had us at that round table. It was like all the sound around us was completely drowned out. I was just consumed with this sisterhood that was sitting around this table who got me, who got me, and I could talk to for the first time. And 40 years later, when you hear the stories on the panel, when you hear the stories throughout this hotel, throughout this entire week, this entire city, you hear that over and over again. It's that sisterhood, that brotherhood, those small groups where you can share the grief experience with others when the rest of the world, even though we can be as supportive as possible, we just don't know. No. And our words of, of consolation and of love just are never going to be the same as what you can get from that group. Exactly. And this was before cell phones and like I said I couldn't find yep. any kind of grief counseling or anything at that time. I in particular connected with a widow from Michigan her name was Lydia Scott and she was going through the same thing and had young children pending murder trial and our phone bills were outrageous mm -hmm. absolutely outrageous I mean like four or five hundred dollars a month but we were that connected and in fact we were talking on the phone to each other and said Oh my God, we need our own organization. Get on the phone, call Susie. Susie, we need our own organization. What does Susie say? She says, damn, with two syllables. <laughs> damn! <laughs> You're right! <laughs> and that's what got the ball rolling, yeah. and you rolled it, girl. You rolled Thank it. You. Thank and you. I, but we all rolled it. We did. We did. We did. And I mean, I remember being there, she was writing grants in the basement. I was sleeping in her little boy's bed, and she was cooking enchiladas, <laughs> chicken enchiladas, writing grants to that first year, trying to get this organization off the ground. Yeah. And look where it is. Look what, look it's what amazing. That's an awesome explanation of how the organization started. But bear with my question here. How did you go from that to literally all the steps from enchiladas, from grants, to starting the organization, which has grown to this. Because this doesn't just happen because you have a good idea, you know, and you see a need. There's a lot of work that has to go. So how did you start this from the ground up? <laughs> go. Oh, you're asking yeah, me. I'm asking the both well, of you. you she know pointed what? to you. Yeah, she did point to me. Uh, you know, they were all new survivors, so they were dealing with their grief. They had issues there, and so they just said to me, can you make this work? And I said, I think I can. And so I got the bylaws, and I got the 501c3. We came up with the name. Everything was ready by the next uh, May. So you what? shot down my name, by the way. I did shoot down your <laughs> what name. What was it? Come on. Support. Well, Support. It's like Survivors United of Past Police Officers Reaching Out Today. Yeah. She said, that's too long. Too long. I agree. And then she said, cops. I said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I did all the paperwork. Everything was ready. Um, I started to make plans for the first National Police Survivors Conference. Uh, we had a little trouble getting addresses for the survivors, so we would send to the agencies. Unfortunately, the agencies may not pass it on, you know, forward it to the families. But um, the first conference was on May 14th, 1984. Everything was in place. They voted unanimously to organize concerns of police survivors. We had 110 survivors there, and we were shocked at the response. I mean, you know, you don't, don't go to the first thing and there's... 110 people there, it starts out sometimes with 50. <laughs> right. So we were really excited about the numbers that showed up, and we did breakout sessions, and did we have people talk? Well, we had and people that, talk. And let's say something about breakout yeah. sessions, too, because when I told Susie we need our own organization, and she said, damn, with two syllables, <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, what are we going to talk about? I said, we'll talk about death, oh, that's right. we'll talk about murder trials, we'll talk about single parenthood, about trying to figure out finances. At that time, I mean, you got 50,000 mm -hmm. bucks, you know, and that's, you're going to live no, on that. For that's a lot. That oh, was, yeah. oh, that was a lot. Yeah, yeah. right. So, um, and sure. so that's what we said. I said, <clears throat> yeah, we need to talk about this kind of stuff because this is what's real. This is the thing. These are the things I'm facing right now, and these are the things that I need help and assistance with. And if I do, I know these other women do too. Yeah. 
and um, see, she directed me really right. well. Yeah, she like she, Leonard yeah. Bernstein here. <laughs> yeah, but and um, yeah. So, yeah. but then we did the and and the whole point of that first grant was to understand the impact of line of duty death on survivors. Right. That is what we were writing that first grant on. Mm -hmm. That and you can tell how all of that went. You know. Yeah. That was actually about. Mm. Are we ready to go there? We can do, do whatever okay. you like. And at some point when you're done, I'll involve this side of the couch. They've We're been good. patiently yeah, waiting. Good. No. Well, well we about, about uh, two years after that, there's a little story there, too. Um, I went to my mom and I said, I went up to Pennsylvania to visit her. We were living in the D.C. area. And I said, uh, Mom, this, play, this thing could really work if I had some money. And she goes, call Charlie. And I said, call Charlie, you know, from a coal miner's town. I thought it could be the head janitor. Why would I call Charlie? You say he work, works at Justice. Is he a janitor? What is he, Mom? I don't know, but he's a big shot. So I went home, called Charlie, and Charlie was a big shot. <laughs> we walked right into the deputy attorney general's office. We talked about it for a while, and the deputy general uh, counsel said, Charlie, we need, we need to fund this. We, we need to make it work. Lois, Lois Harrington. Hay Lois, Hay Lois Harrington. Harrington. Yep. And she was Good on, girl. And she was on Reagan's Victims' Rights Task Force. Yes. And she basically took that grant and walked it through. Walked it through. And that was the first opportunity that we had money. Yeah. Besides you sending me to Arizona to the FOP conference, with right. Trudy, and saying, Lynn, go out and tell them your story and they'll give us money because <laughs> we don't have the And so they pushed me true. out there and they said, just fly out to fly out to Phoenix to this conference. And so I go out there and this is this is a funny story that I remember. Okay, go ahead. I know what it I'm is. I'm at the airport oh. and they said, and we'll have an officer there to pick you up. So I'm at the airport and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And my plane came in and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. I'm waiting and I see this man and he was plain clothes. He didn't have a uniform on, otherwise I would have said something. And he walked back and forth and back and forth. And by the time, you know, all the passengers are already gone and I'm still sitting there and he's going back and forth. And then finally he came up to me and he said, Are you a police widow? And I said, Yes. He said, Oh, I was expecting somebody so much older. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, oh, I was only goodness. 26, and he just oh, thought, widow, gotcha. I'm mm -hmm. going to be an old older widow. woman. Yeah. But he didn't expect to see a 26-year-old um, widow. We'll I have a that question. Room. Yes. How much was that first grant? One, $174,000. Really? $174, For 110? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. 110 widows in... 1984. It was, a, it was all family. All families. So yeah. 100, 100, yeah, 110 in 1984. Yeah. How many do we have here? So COPS year? currently serves over 80,000 survivors. Oh, this year at National yeah. Police Week, yeah. we have um, just under 5,000 survivors registered attending this week. Yeah. I want an answer from both of you on this question. You can choose the order. Could you ever have imagined that it would grow to this? I'll give that one to you. I stand in <laughs> awe. To me, it's a God thing. I stand in awe when I look out at the sea of blue or green or brown or whatever and see all those families. I stand in awe of what this has become. I just think it all fell in place. No, it really didn't. <laughs> we, we had a lot of barriers to, to climb over, and some were there from law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know? Um, they don't really need this. Are you sure, you're really sure they want this? Oh, man. it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. Well, you got to make it work. And that's what we did. Yes, I look out and uh, I, I see the, the crowds, and it's like unbelievable. I've been retired for 12 years. I came here, and you know, I make people laugh. And boy, did I get hit emotionally today just to hear the stories again, to know that the same officers that initiated my interest in helping survivors Clag. was the same, I, I should say Rusty Claggett and Brian Swart from Prince George's County PD. Um, also helped Chris Cosgriff get the Officer Down Memorial page done. And uh, when the death of two officers initiates two major national programs, it really had the effect on, on this whole region in, in the D.C. area. 
I guess my perspective is, I guess because I'm, I'm, we're, we are living in that right now. Like we're living in that growth, and I look back over like the last ten years and the and the sharp spike in growth. And while it feels like something that we should celebrate, that we have these programs that we can offer, and it's getting larger and it's getting more sophisticated, and those things as we've as we've gotten, I guess as technology has improved and everything, but. The reality is, is that it grows at the rate of the death of the officers in the country. So right. it's really hard to celebrate an organization that we would really rather never see grow. Um, but yeah, it has grown swiftly, and it's it's definitely on a, a tra trajectory to keep growing with the amount of loss that we've had. Could you ever have imagined when you first got in the organization that it would be what it is May 14th, 2024? Well, I'm kind of the young kid on the block. No, really, I am. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm an older are. person, but my loss was in 2017. And um, so I really haven't seen what you all have experienced. And m being on the board in 2019, 2020, I came on the board. So I really didn't get to see all that. But what I can tell you is that last night, I think it was last night, was the candlelight, was that last night? Was last, night. Um, last night, as I sat on that stage and I saw all those candles out there and those lights, I realized how many people we are affecting mm -hmm. by doing what we're doing and how that is helping them get through day to day. And so that's mm -hmm. what I saw. Um, obviously, you mentioned the numbers, and we never want that number to grow, but we do want to serve that community. What's the biggest challenge currently that you have on a day in and day out basis? I don't want to say necessarily keeping the organization going, but but to serve that community. What's the biggest challenge? So we've had such a big spike in growth. Um, we don't want to lose what we do. Like our mission has never wavered, and it never will. So. We have to take good care of those families. We promise that we will. They count on us to do that. And so that becomes challenging when you have, you know, you go from, you know, in 2019, we had 228 officers we honored. In 2023, it was 463. That is a huge number of influx of families. So trying to, to give the same level of service when the numbers are increasing, and, and of course, funding is always a concern when that happens. Um, but really, just trying to make sure we don't lose what we are which is, you know, we're here to serve survivors. And if we become so big that we become robotic, that's bad. Like we really need to stay a small organization that is capable of large things. And I want to add there that family dynamics have changed so much, even while I've sat here. Um, and what I've seen is so many grandparents are now helping with their grandchildren. They're raising their grandchildren. So at one point, it was spouses. Then we added um, categories, more and more categories. And I can see the dynamics of our families are going to be adding more categories, like our grandchildren. Our grandparents are raising, they go and pick up their grandchildren at the schools. And so we need to keep moving forward in the different categories that we are facing. You get into this business of law enforcement, not because you want to carry a gun or wear a badge. You get into it because you want to help people, All right? That's mm -hmm. why. That's true. So what do you think your husband, late husband, would think of all of this? Oh. Well, I don't know if you've ever read his paper at the, at the office, but you know, his blood, I don't think he would have ever realized that, that his blood would water a tree that would grow this. And I think of that, um, like I said, I, I just say it's such a God thing. I, I really don't have any words for that. I know he would be honored. I know that for me, it says your death wasn't in vain. Your sacrifice was not in vain. That we have been able to reach all of these people, to have a face of hope 
for others year after year after year and I've been here 40 years and um, you know God doesn't comfort us to make us comfortable but yeah. rather to make us comforters when we have survived what seems to be the unsurvivable when death itself would seem easier than going on um, why would we not share that with others like we, the song that we always close with, why wouldn't we take a hand? Why wouldn't we do that? Take a hand and show somebody else how to get to the other side. And with all the years that we've got behind us, what a blessing it's been to see those who are come in so broken, mm -hmm. they can hardly walk, they can hardly speak, they're going through the motions, just as I remember, putting one foot in front of the other, and that is a chore in itself, and then to see them come in the next year, daring to smile mm -hmm. and not feel guilty about it, you know, and to show, and for them to be showing, I can laugh again, I can be happy again, and now I'm going to help somebody else, you know. So I think that's part of the whole mission. Exactly. And absolutely. And um, you're doing it well, mm -hmm. even with all these grow, growing pains. You guys are. You know, I sing to it. I, I became involved in COPS because I lost a, a co-worker. I'm a retired law enforcement. I lost a co-worker, a dear friend in the line of duty who was 26 years old um, and shot and killed. Um, she saw, shot on a traffic stop and died 30 days later. Um, and at that time, we didn't, we were an hour and a half literally from the national office and didn't even know what COPS was. And. Uh, our agency had never had one before. We were completely unprepared for that. I don't know if you could ever prepare for it, but you can certainly have a little bit of your ducks in a row, and we did not. We had a great chief. I think Susie reached out to him. I think they had conversations. Um, but the reason I'm involved with COPS is because of exactly what Lynn is talking about. Molly's parents um, went to a COPS retreat, and she was killed in February, or she died in February, and she went. they went to the parents' retreat in October of the same year, about 10 months after after she was, uh, uh, after she died. And uh, at that point, they came back to our, our, they would always come to our department and they would always try to take care of us, which that's, if you knew them, you'd know that they're, they're definitely givers. And they would come try taking care, take, take care of us where we would have done anything for them, right? We would have done anything for them. And we did everything we could think to do, but we didn't know how to help them with their grief. We didn't know how to help them. And Dave was so sad. I mean, it was a sadness like I've never seen on a, person before but he came down that hallway that day after he went to parents retreat and he he and I was at that point I was like oh gosh I'm gonna have to deal with the emotions of Dave and I, and I feel bad about that to this day because now I mean I, I, I mean I, even then I dearly loved him but it was a lot to deal mm -hmm. with right yeah. but he came down that hallway and he looked at me he says Diane come here I'm like, he's not usually that forceful and I was like okay I went over and talked to him and he said he goes I went to this parents retreat and he goes and I met this lady and she's kind of crazy. He was talking about you. I, I, thought, I, thought, it was, I thought it was Connie. <laughs> Connie was the whole part of time. Yeah. He goes, she's kind of crazy. He goes, but we were doing this thing at parents retreat, and, and I didn't. She wanted me to climb a wall, and I didn't want to climb a wall. So she climbed this wall with me. And as we climbed this wall, she she yelled out to everybody. And I'm going to do this in this podcast. She yelled out that. that I went, I went over the edge with Dave Thomas. And she said, they came out he, goes, he goes, and I had this thought, this is completely inappropriate. <laughs> he said, but he goes, then I laughed out loud. And he goes, really, he realized that he hadn't laughed out loud since his daughter was killed. Right. And uh, he goes, I think after talking to those parents and realizing that it is okay to laugh and to be okay, it's okay to be okay. He says, I think I'm going to be okay. And when I was looking to figure out what I was going to do with my next job, I knew that I wanted to do something that could help somebody the way Susie helped Dave Thomas. And you know, so she's it. And you know, I remember, I remember when we were at our previous host hotel, I remember us sitting in the lobby, it was the end of police week, and we were talking about how far things had come, and, and you said to me, and I've got this idea, I've got this I've got this idea. We're gonna do. We're gonna do camp. We're gonna do camp for kids. I remember you saying yeah. that. I remember the exact bench we were sitting on, and um, and I thought, wow, that's really kind of a great idea, Susie. And then all these retreats, and seriously, those hands-on programs, these retreats where we are able to bring these different groups of people, spouses, parents, coworkers, you know, children, adult children, etc. 
those are the places where these real connections are made. I mean, Police Week is beautiful, but it's all about the officer. We're honoring that officer. Yeah, there's connections made here, but it's those secondary hands-on programs that where the real connections and growth happen. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What is so fascinating to me, and I'm, I'm going to call myself an outsider because I am in this context. You guys have definitely brought me in. I feel like I'm included, but in reality, I am not part of this community of grief. But as somebody as an outsider, I can see, and I see the change in people. You can tell when somebody has, and again, confidence, I don't, I don't want to use the word confidence because I that, that, that think that's the wrong word, but that sense of relief, they're never going to forget their loved one. Who no. died. I mean, that's, they're never going to forget that till the day that they pass away. But you can see that weight lifted off, and it is, I think you ladies all touch upon it, it is that you have freedom to enjoy part of your life again. Absolutely. Uh, and you can literally see that weight lifted off of some individuals. Sure. Uh, by the same token, you know, I look out in that audience on a day like today when we're doing a panel for, quite frankly, the new survivors. Mm -hmm. And you can see that weight has not been lifted. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be right. some significant amount right. of time mm -hmm. before that, that weight is lifted. And especially, obviously, it, it hits when I look and you were a 26-year-old widow. Mm -hmm. It looks when you, it hurts when you see like that the really young people and of course the kids yeah. um, and I, I said it today I'm always amazed by the strength that I see in the kids it, it, it boggles my mind um, their ability to be strong but you know they have their moments Listen, and they have to I would not wish this journey this pain on anyone on my worst enemy it was the worst thing I ever had to go through in my life and it was such a complex, I mean, when somebody takes the life of another, murders them, I mean, it's just so hard for us to wrap our heads around it. Um, so it, it's just such a complicated kind of grief to try and grasp that. And it's a journey. And like I said, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But I also know that the greatest opportunity for growth comes through that adversity when you're able to get to the other side of it and good things can come from it if you allow it mm -hmm. yes. and if you yes. allow Thank yourself you. to be an instrument i remember saying god use me i don't want this to be for naught if there's something good that can come from this i want to be part of it but then you better hold on to your hat you better hold on to your hat because you don't know what that's going to be you yeah. say that you say that prayer you better hold on to your hat um, and be ready. And um, I, I've just been so blessed to be a part of this organization for all these years and to walk this journey and to have someone like Susie and Trudy to be the ones when, to help make it happen. You made it happen. And look at this legacy and it will go on and on because it's needed. Because it's going there. It's going there. I, I think about. I think about. I tell this story often when I talk about cops. Because you brought up the kids, and I wanted to I hit on that because it, obviously you had small children at the time too. But um, I, I want to tell the story about kids camp. And I know we don't have a lot of time yet, so I'll be brief. But um, my first year at camp, I, I I ran into a little boy that he was at the six-year-olds counseling group because we counsel them by age because grief changes as they age mm -hmm. at their different ages. Um, so. He, was, he had just finished his counseling session. We were going to, to lunch, and uh, he, was, he was skipping down the sidewalk. And, of course, I was walking because I'm old and he's six. <laughs> but as we're going down there, I still skip. What you um, do? We're skipping down there, and I, and I said, I'm going I'm to call him Alex for this, for this story. But as we're skipping down there, I, I asked him, I said, hey, Alex, how do you like kids camp so far? And he, and he looked at me straight in the eye, and he goes, I love kids camp. And I said, well, what do you love most about kids camp? And he said to me, he goes, I love that here everybody's dad died. And it literally stopped me in my tracks because as a six-year-old boy, he felt normal at kids' camp. And, and it was huge. And when I talked to his mom later, and I, was t I told him about that conversation that I had, and she said, oh, you have no idea. And I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, he just finished his kindergarten year. And when he was in kindergarten, he was talking about his dad who had been shot in the head. And he was talking about it in kindergarten. And they had to have a conversation with him about how it was disturbing the other kids that he was talking about how his dad died but at kids camp 
you could talk about how your dad died and it's normal and he felt normal there. It's peer support. It's what COPS was founded on 40 years ago. It's what it is now. It's at age six. It's at age oh, 76. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's the whole span of the gamut, but it's peer support. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing to watch. Well, one of the cool things out of camp too is we have, uh, I think maybe five couples that met at camp. Yes. And now married. Yes. Well, that are married. married. I don't yeah. think you yes. want to put that on our advertisement. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think that's the coolest thing. But the whole thing, cool. the whole thing is, she said, I met him, I know all about him, we've helped each other through difficult times, of course he's going to be a great guy to marry. And so many of them are, are going back to law enforcement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think if it had been, you know, if I'd been in your situations, I would have had difficulty with letting my kid become a cop. But, um, you know, we have one, one survivor that has seven people in their family now that are law enforcement officers since her husband died. I find that absolutely amazing. But when the kids have grown up to the point where they know it's time to get married and I really like this guy, I find that a miracle too. I mean, it's just like, how does it work out? But it does. It's awesome. And they're doing really well. So what are you going to do? Have a, have a great it's life. It's full circle. Yeah. It's full circle. It's yeah. It may very well be the matches made in heaven. Yeah, that's a great point. When I saw something this time that I haven't seen before, and that is we have so many law enforcement officers here, and I wanted um, especially Scott's agency to come and see what Police Week was all about. They've heard it, but they've not actually witnessed it. And I had a conversation with the chief, and it was an educational, <clears throat> excuse me, this police week was an education to him, to those officers, even though they didn't know Scott, it taught them what they need to do to help the survivors. It was truly enlightening to them. So we are not only affecting survivors, we are affecting our law enforcement officers by helping them to help others and letting them know that our my husband's legacy will move forward because I'm supporting those law enforcement officers. 40 years from now, when presumably there are all new people sitting in here talking about the 80th yeah, anniversary of cops. <laughs> yeah, <please>. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Um, and again, I, I want you to answer this question not from the perspective of, you know, there could be so many more cop deaths because obviously we know that that is a function of the job and we pray that it doesn't happen, but we know it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the organization, what's your vision 40 years from now? How do you see this? Well, I'm going to be asked oh, to talk. <laughs> no, no. Um, it, it's going to be what it has always been meant to be. As long as you have people who are there and they need the support and they give the support to one another, it's going to be successful throughout. Great leadership, right there it is. I mean, we've gone to a new level. Uh, I think it's safe. It's always been very highly recommended. Uh, the people like the way it's run. She's going to go uh, a lot longer than me, but um, maybe I'll be back for the next 80th. Next 80? I don't sure. think so. <laughs> but it'd be, it'd be fun to watch down on it. How's that? Yeah, uh, 40, years, 40 years from now? Yeah. yeah, unless I live to be 108. Yeah, I'm out of here. But, but, you know, one thing, I mean, this has been our baby. Yeah. And it's hard to walk away from it oh. after, for 40 years. It's hard to walk away when we've been here from the very, very beginning. But yet, just with what you just said, it is such a comfort to know it's in such good hands. It is in good hands. It's like it's kind. it was handed over, and look at you guys. It's yeah. in such good hands. So it's such a comfort to those of us that have been here from the start. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for paving yeah. the way for us because you started the ball rolling. Now it's up to us to keep it rolling. I, I think about from where it came from with those 110 at the first retreat to where we where we are now and I think we got there because we were 
able to adapt and change to whatever. And you did it for the first three years. You adapted and changed it over and over and over again. And we've been doing it for 10 years. So we have to adapt to what's going on around us. But the biggest key is we can't lose sight of what the mission statement, I'm assuming you all That's came right. up with at that very first conference or before, of rebuilding shattered lives. And what's really unique about this organization is I think you can ask about any survivor who is not brand new, and maybe even some of them, but the brand, if you ask a, a survivor that's been around us at all what the mission is, rebuilding shattered lives will come out of every one of their mouths. Name another organization that somebody actually even knows what their own mission statement is. Right. We do, our survivors do, and as long as that happens, we're going to be just fine. Yeah. That's right. Connie, I'm pressing you. 40 years from now, what I just, does this cops look like? I believe that we are being much more kinder as we travel through um, ages. And we're learning that we have to be kind to one another. And I see people grabbing a hold of us and helping one another that's how we get through things that's how you get strength is by going out there and helping someone else so 40 years from now i just 80 years from now 100 years from now the kindness needs to just keep moving forward and i believe that our organization is showing people how to do that right I think the unexpected joy that comes the unexpected blessing comes from doing what we do is that when you give you get far yeah, more than so you far give. more than you give well, for mar far more than what you give but you yeah. don't realize that right and that's the unexpected blessing of doing what we do you give you get for those who are watching you probably have to wrap up here i want you to give a message to the person who has decided to watch this podcast for the last more than a half an hour what you want them to think about when they think of COPS and if they're searching for that organization to be a part of or they're searching for an organization to help, to be kind, to either give time or treasure to, what do you want them to take away from this amazing group? Connie? Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. The donors keep swimming. We got it. We, we, we need that help to keep swimming. And the survivors, you know what? That's, that's how we honor our fallen, by being and doing what they would want us to do. I, I would tell someone who's watching this, if they're a survivor especially, is to take a chance. Do something slightly Good. out of your comfort zone. Good. Become involved in something, even if you're a total introvert like I am. Get yourself involved in it. You, the, the reward that comes back to you will be tenfold just by taking a chance. Take a chance on us, and if you don't like it, go away. Yeah. But I tell you what, they don't. They come because once you take a chance, you're going to get hooked in like every other survivor yeah. does. So take a chance, would be what I'd say. I'd like to encourage people to take a look at the charity navigator uh, level there of all the organizations out here fundraising. COPS is top notch. There's hundreds of other police organizations that really don't serve anybody. And I think if you take a look at where your money will go, you'll realize that you can help this organization extremely better than giving it to an organization that really doesn't have a, a mission statement. They may have the boards and everything and file their paperwork, but how much is really going to their programs? Mm -hmm. What is ours, Diane? Um, out of a dollar, 90 cents. Goes yeah. to a service. Yes, yeah. that's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, um, support law enforcement. I mean, yes. everybody here supports law enforcement. Of course, it's us. But there is a humongous <laughs> number of people nationwide that support it as well. Um, we need it. We want you to be out there. I would love. I would love to see like a national citizens club take over the memorial service and pay for it and say this is from the rotary club mm -hmm. of america and have them pay why are police organizations paying for their own memorial services when the citizens should step that forward they protect yeah the ones we protect save us you know good point and i guess in speaking 
as a survivor and two survivors, I would say, um, you know, blue, when you're blue family, and I'm also retired law enforcement, you're blue family forever. And um, just, we're here for you and let us help you on that road to hope. Um, and show you what it looks like. It's there. Hope. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for, Thank for you. joining us and, and pulling these stories out of us. Because sometimes, uh, you know, we, 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 we just do, 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 but we don't sometimes look back and reflect on from where we came and where we're going. And I think that's been just an awesome experience. So thank you for being here. Lynn and Su Su Susie, I mean, gosh, thanks for starting everything and paving the way. And this truly is your legacy. There's no doubt. And with this gal leading it, who knows where we're going, but it's forward. That's right. For who sure. knows where we're going? Well, but you better tell you what. It's going to be a lot of fun. Good thing I was on a swim team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Inside joke. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks.